After listening to her final sermon at Glenmar last week, I said to Mandy Sayers, I sure don't envy whoever has to preach next. Now, since I make out the preaching schedule, I could have uh, assigned somebody else for this week, but when the, when the countdown clock on my dresser says 21 days until retirement, the phrase final four takes on a new meaning. And today begins the last of four sermons in which I hope to share some of the things that uh, I've learned in uh, 43 years in ministry. That's a, that's a tall assignment, and there's really a gift today because the, the message in that uh, second reading that Brian read for us, the message from the day of Pentecost, really focuses on one of the things that I would want to identify as the most important things I've learned in uh, all these years in ministry. That story is a very dramatic story. We had uh, this service, something we didn't have at the other services. We had the sound of the rushing wind when, uh, when Brian read about the, the wind. We didn't have uh, tongues of flame or tongues of fire on the heads of the, of the apostles. But this was before the days of uh, special effects. So it must have been pretty overwhelming for the people who were there. But of all the remarkable things about this story of Pentecost, it seems to me the most remarkable is that every single person who was there heard the gospel in a language they could understand. Everyone heard the gospel in a language they could understand. And that was no small feat because the story says there were people there from all over the world speaking all different kinds of languages. This is really one of those tests for lay readers. Once a year they get to read this passage that has all these names of these places that are hard to pronounce. What it says is that there were people there from pretty much everywhere in the known world at that time. And and actually, somehow, each of them was able to hear the message of the good news of God's love in a way that they could understand it. That's nothing short of miraculous when you consider how many different people there were and how many different languages they were speaking. If you just count up the numbers and you know that there were only 11 apostles to do the speaking, there were a lot more, there were people there speaking a lot more than 11 languages. How it worked, we don't know, but somehow, through the Holy Spirit, everyone who was there that day was able to hear and understand about God's love. Not surprising that the people who were there were confused. The, the scripture says they were perplexed, they were bewildered, they were amazed, they were astonished. Can't seem to come up with enough words to say they really had no clue what was going on. So they said, how can this be? And that's a question we might want to ask ourselves today. How could it be that all kinds of people from all over the world from all walks of life, can hear and understand the story of Jesus and God's love. How can lots of different people, speaking lots of different languages, hear and understand that God loves them? Well, this is the first example of what came to be called spiritual gifts. The spirit, the the story says, let's, let's look back, the story says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, these apostles hadn't been studying other languages for years. One minute they spoke only one language, the next minute they were speaking in a way that everybody there could understand. And the reason that they were doing this was not so they could show off or show they could, so they could pass a test in another language, the purpose, it makes clear here, is that they were given this gift of being able to speak in these, what came to be called tongues, so that others could hear and understand the good news of God's love. This was the first, of, the first example of what we've come to call spiritual gifts. And in this case... God gave the gift of being able to speak in other languages to these apostles so that everyone could hear and understand God's love for them. But that's not the only way that people hear about God's love. And it's a good thing, too, because not everybody can stand up in front of a group and speak like the apostles spoke that day in Jerusalem. 
In fact, studies indicate that, uh, that for most people next to dying, the thing they fear most is speaking in public. And some people fear speaking in public more than dying. They'd rather die than stand up and speak in front of people. But fortunately, that's not the only gift the Spirit gives to help people hear and understand about God's love. In fact, if we turn, if we go a little bit later in Scripture, we go into Paul's letter to the Romans, we find a list of spiritual gifts. And they include things like wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, faith, working of miracles, healing. Lots of different ways that God gives people gifts to enable them to communicate God's love. Or if we turn into, uh, into 1 Corinthians, we find some things that like ministry, teaching, giving, leading, showing mercy, having compassion. These are all ways that people are able to communicate the good news of God's love. And they are part of the gifts that God has given to different people. But here's the key. The purpose of all spiritual gifts is to help others learn about God's love. No matter what the spiritual gift is, whether it's preaching or teaching, whether it's leading or giving or caring or helping, the purpose for all spiritual gifts is to help other people learn about God's love. And Part of, God, part of the beauty of God's plan for the church is that there are lots of different people with lots of different gifts who use those gifts so that everyone can hear the news of the gospel in a way that they can understand. There are no exceptions. There are no exemptions. Everyone has been given one or more spiritual gifts. Now, we live in one of the most affluent and best educated counties in this country and in the world. And in Howard County, I think it's probably true, this has been my observation, and a number of people who, who teach schools in Howard County have confirmed this to me, that probably 90 to 95 percent of the parents in Howard County think that their children are gifted and talented, that their children ought to be identified and placed in gifted and talented programs. The reality, of course, is that at most, only something like maybe 20 to 25 percent of all the students in Howard County are actually identified as gifted and talented and enrolled in gifted and talented programs. But here's the good news. In the church, 100 percent of God's children are gifted and talented. No exceptions. No one is left out. Everybody is gifted and talented. Not in a way that may help them get into a special class or do well, have good scores on tests. Not even in a way necessarily that will help them to get a good job or make lots of money. But gifted and talented in a way that enables them to help other people learn how much God loves them. Every single person is gifted and talented in that way. You are gifted and talented. Now that's not going to help you get a good score in school or get a good job in the workforce, but it is going to help you be a part of the way that God tells people how much God loves them. And it's really important that we have lots of different people with lots of different gifts because not everyone gets the news of God's love in the same way. This understanding really crystallized for me when I was reading a little book. Some of you may have read it as well. It's a book really written for husbands and wives. It's called The Five Love Languages. Now, what the author points out in this book is that um, not everyone understands that they are loved in the same way. Some people get that message in different ways. And the author identifies five love languages, five ways of conveying love to another person. He talks about words of affirmation. You look nice today. Thank you for doing that for me. I really appreciate you. Words of affirmation. Quality time. Just being with someone. 
setting aside other things and being with them. Gifts, candy, flowers, a gift certificate for the golf course. Well, you know, let's be fair here. Equal time, the ladies want flowers and candy. The men would appreciate a gift certificate for the golf course. Okay? So, words of affirmation, quality time, um, gifts, acts of service, taking out the garbage, washing the dishes, acts of service. And then fifthly, physical touch, affection, expressions of affection. Well, what the authors point out is that these are ways that people experience the message, get the message that they are loved. But here's the problem. Sometimes, in fact, more often than not, husbands and wives don't speak the same love language. Now, let me illustrate this for you from my own experience, and I have to tell you, I have my wife's permission to share this with you. It took us years to discover that we weren't speaking the same language. Early in our marriage, I had grown up in a home in which love was expressed through what the authors of the book would call acts of service. So I went out of my way to do everything I could to show my wife, Joan, how much I loved her. I would do the dishes. I would clean the house. I would go shopping, even though I hate to go shopping. But all this was my way of trying to let Joan know how much I loved her. What I didn't know then is that her love language is quality time. She wants me to spend time with her. And so all this time I'm killing myself doing things to let her know how much I love her. She's getting more and more frustrated because instead of spending quality time with her, I'm out doing the dishes, cleaning the house, and going shopping. We were, and, and we still do this after 44 years of marriage, we were talking past each other. We were speaking different languages. See, we all have a unique way that we need to hear or receive the information that tells us how much someone loves us. But here's the key. The same thing is true of God's love. Not everyone gets the message of God's love in the same way. Some people will get it in one way and others will get it in another way. But here's the neat thing. Our spiritual gifts represent the love languages of the gospel. Our spiritual gifts represent the love languages of the gospel. Our gifts are the way that people, different people, get it that God loves them. Now some people will get that message through preaching or teaching, but that's not everyone. Other people will receive the good news through acts of compassion and caring, through some, someone visiting them when they're in the hospital, or praying with them before surgery, or offering them help when they need it. Some will receive the good news through a meal that's brought to them at a time of family crisis or a time when they're grieving the loss of a loved one. Some people will receive the good news through a helping hand extended when they're down and need someone to help them. Others will receive the good news when someone simply spends time with them and listens to them as a caring friend. And others will hear the good news that God loves them when they're encouraged or when they're, when they're, when they're supported, when they're going through a hard time. There are lots of different ways that people get the idea that God loves them. But here's the beauty of it. God has provided people, you and me, with different gifts who can speak the language that will communicate God's love to all different people. No one of us with our particular gifts can reach everyone. But all of us, functioning together in a way that God designed can reach nearly everyone with the good news of Jesus and God's love. So when you go prepare a meal at the carpenter's kitchen, someone through that act is going to discover how much God loves them. When, when you repair a house with Habitat for Humanity or go on a mission trip to Virginia or to the Bahamas, when you stand at the door of the church and greet people on Sunday morning, when you teach a Sunday school class, when you prepare and serve a meal to a family who have come to celebrate the life of a loved one, 
All of those are a way of communicating to people how much God loves them. And when we don't use our gifts, not only is God disappointed, I think, but there must be someone somewhere who doesn't learn how much God loves them. See, if there's anything I've learned in 43 years in ministry, it's that every one of God's children is gifted and talented. And that God uses our gifts to help other people not only hear about God's love, but to experience God's love. When we use our gifts, others are able to experience God's love. Pastors can't do it alone. Teachers can't do it alone. Greeters can't do it alone. Helping hands can't do it alone. But together, all of us, using the gifts that God has given us, can communicate to the people of this world how much God loves them. You are gifted and talented, not in a way that may help you get ahead in the world or score better on tests, but in a way that will help you be a part of God's plan to let other people know how much God loves them. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful that we have heard the good news of your love for us. We are thankful that uh, someone in some way used their gifts to help us understand your love for us. We are amazed that you can use us to tell that good news to others. We are astonished that you've given us gifts, not so that uh, we can brag or shine, but so we can be a part of sharing that good news of your love with others. So help us to discover our gifts and help us to use our gifts for the purpose that you gave them, so that through us, others might know of your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.